Well, thanks for being the last session, last peers here. I still <laughs> hope I don't hold you guys for too long here. And the idea today is going to share a little bit of the experience we have been having with uh, with edge computing. Um, I mean, here it was, it's not a brief person, as you can see. There's a lot of information there. But I have uh, I've been working with uh, mostly software in my entire life, and uh, been for a long time here also working on some of the automation side but mostly on control and how to add, like, especially in the digital, digital transformation for, for uh, automation of industry manufacturing. So software is always, has always been a little bit the side of the automation that uh, uh, sits mostly on the control side. So when you think about what, what does it mean like your programs or robots and all this, it's, it's really thinking about how to build the process controlling the machines and usually that information stays and is used for that for that part. I I used to joke with my customers like machines are digital for a few decades already, right? But uh, we are continuing that this has been changing quite a bit in terms of topology, in terms of architecture lately, um, because of edge computing. So edge computing is a new layer in the way things work and operate. Uh, it goes a little bit beyond than just uh, manufacturing or industry. There are several different areas that, uh, that are being impacted by edge computing. Like one of our customers, for example, is a telephone company. They do have a lot of edge computing. It's a different concept than, than it is in manufacturing or industry. Because edge computing for, the, for cell phones is uh, all the computers that are running under the towers. So towers to connect cell, cell phones, they have uh, uh, computation capacity sitting there. And the telephone companies are trying to find a way, hey, can I use that telephone capacity? For example, instead of when you run your app on your phone, instead of sending all the data back all the way to the back end in the cloud, we could run some of the information locally closer to the cell phone. So what exactly is edge computing? Why does it matter? So we then, uh, here in the show, it's interesting because we're kind of, uh, I was trying to find more about edge computing here. This show is very focused on the automation side. But we have a lot of people coming to us and discussing, like, we're building an edge layer. We need integration with the machines and the, and the control side. And, and it's happening for different reasons and cases. So one of the purposes of our presentation today is to share a little bit about those projects with you, where we have been involved and what people are doing with edge computing, what kind of solutions they're trying to do with edge computing. Okay? So, so the first question, like, which edge computing are we talking about, right? So, um, I want to share a little bit with you uh, uh, what is the state of the, what's happening with edge computing right now in terms of definition. It's becoming more and more uh, a segment of knowledge in terms of IT. And you can see the gardener starting to cover more about edge computing and giving it some of its own attention. Um, it's evolving in different ways, I think, uh, when you think about what kind of solutions are coming for us here. There is a ton of startups on the hardware side. Like if you search edge gateways on Google, you're gonna find an immense amount of Most of them are based on a very specific platform like ARM based, but there are all kinds of, of uh, edge solutions in terms of the hardware. There's not a lot in terms of software though. Like what does it mean software? And then I think there's a reason for that. So we're gonna talk a little bit about that. And then we're gonna get into the case studies. Okay, there are a list of case studies here. I do not have names because they all have EAs. Um, but if you guys want to talk later after the presentation or something, you can find ways here to share some more information in case it's just really, I can also get one slide here just so that you understand what's going on. But the, the cases there are quite different as you can see the reasons why people are using edge computing and why they're consuming edge computing. Okay. So speaking a little bit about edge computing, that's Garvin's definition, right? So Garvin defines it's a physical location when things and people connect with the network digital world are very vague, right? So, um, why is edge computing? Why, number one, why is it called edge computing? Number two, why does it matter? Uh, isn't, isn't that a layer that always existed? Uh, what, how did that happen? I think I have the opinion that a lot of the importance of edge computing came as a little bit of a pushback of the push to the cloud. Uh, I remember in 2016, I was in a presentation, I was in, in a show with Carmen in Barcelona, and uh, one of the speakers came up on the stage and he was wearing a smart shirt. Hmm? And I was like, oh, and he was like, oh, why is this a smart shirt? But it's like, why is this a smart shirt? Right? So he's like, oh, this is a smart shirt. I can, why is it smart? Because I can see it. He pulled up his phone. It's like, I can see my heartbeat here. So you can see about the tension because of the presentation. So the heartbeat is really high. So the shirt has sensors 
and he could read all his biometric information on the map. I thought it was super cool. I said, oh, that's amazing, right? So how does that work? So after a presentation, I went upstage and started talking to him. So, so how is your shirt connected to your phone? I was like, oh, it's not connected to the phone at all. The shirt's connected to the cloud. Because it's like, oh. <laughs> As I, mean, I have a background engineer, it's like, well, wait, so what is it? It's like, yeah, well, you, you want to settle it into the cloud first. And then the app connects to the cloud because you were, you first want the data. Uh, so yeah, I guess it makes sense, right? So we can first want, you first want the data, but from the engineer point of view, it doesn't make sense. <laughs> the shirt's right there, the phone's right there. Why not connecting the phone to the shirt immediately? And that got me thinking about, oh, that's an interesting, it's an interesting, interesting conundrum because Yes, push everything to the cloud, push everything to the cloud, said AWS, Google, Azure. Yeah, they're cloud vendors, right? Send everything to the cloud all the time, as much as you can. Yeah, and I, after this presentation, I went and talked to the Gartner guy that is in charge of IoT. He was in charge, he's still in charge of IoT. I was like, well, help me understand, like, what's the point of sending everything to the cloud? He's like, well, we don't want to send all the data to the cloud. You want to send some of the data to the cloud, because it's too much data. I'm like, whoa, okay, so that got a little bit more interesting. So you're telling me, throw data away. <laughs> that is a very weird thing to say to your customer. Like, oh, no, no, you don't want all the data. No, we want all the data, right? So we, we probably want all the data. So you, oh, well, you cannot send all the data to the cloud. It's too expensive. And it's also too, too complicated. I'm like, wow, okay. So that, I think that's where things started to look like. And we, like, we got ourselves involved in several projects where the main point was send all of it to the cloud, then we'll figure it out. But of course, anyone that controls a machine knows that you can't send all, the, all that data to the cloud, right? And I asked this to the doctor analysis, so I was like, well, so you're telling that you should throw data away? He's like, well, you don't want to, like a sensor, for example. You don't want to send information, sensor is, is off, sensor is off, sensor is off. It's not the same data. You can just send sensors off. So you just want the, the delta, you just want when it changes. So you're, you're saying you just want when it changes because it's expensive to send everything else, but if you want to go back and do like root cause analysis, or if you want to do some kind of predictive analytics or maintenance, you have to go back to historical data. You don't have the data. If you want to find out was it off, you can't. Mm. I said, like, ah, well, yeah, okay, all right. Yeah, so it looks very short. I saw the world moving, and I sent all of it to the cloud with IoT. So it happened very frequently, and many, because many projects we were involved, that was the main goal of those projects. But we also started to think about, well, yeah, maybe that's the moment right now, 2016, 15, 16, right? But it's gonna change, because eventually this data is gonna come back. And people said, well, wait, maybe we want to do something here before sending it to the cloud. And this something here before sending it to the cloud, is the edge, right? So you you have the right now technology evolved to a point where we have the capability to collect all the data immediately and store it immediately, and then do what you need to do with that data. If you want to use the data to push it forward and send it to the cloud, yes, you can. If you want to integrate that with uh, artificial intelligence algorithms that require the cloud to run most of the time because of the capacity that GPU requires and all that, it's not necessarily going to be running on the edge. Uh, yes, send it to the cloud, but then you can apply some intelligence to what data you want to send to the cloud and why. Uh, not only that, it also, I think the edge also helped um, expand what can be done for control, right? For controlling machines. Most of the data is right now being used only for uh, to control the machines, but if you, if you all of a sudden you start to look at the data as a more complex scheme of data, if you want to try to put data together, you know, if you want to say, if you want to share the data with other departments of your company, which is like 90% of the projects that we're involved right now are projects where other departments of, the, of your company are interested in the data for your machines and sensors and everything else. And the reason for that, for, for sure, a lot of that is because of AI, right? AI works on data, so AI doesn't really like, you don't have to like to, you don't have to look at the data and say, oh, no, I don't care. No, AI cares about all the data. Because they're really trying to learn out of patterns that they get from the data. So if you if you hold data back, you're missing the opportunity for the AI to figure something out for you that you're not necessarily not seeing. So a lot of those projects are really about let's send everything to the to, to the to the AI side. Okay? And some of that is also coming back with the learning, 
required because it's also easier to train some of the machine uh, machine learning neural network side if you have some of that sitting closer to the data. So some of the models are being pushed down to the edge. Uh, so we do like local training with machine learning and then send those lessons learned up to the central model in the cloud and that also reduces cost a lot. It's also much faster, so we can do it. So those are the definitions, but which type of actual right? grid? So what, what are people doing out there? Like I said, a lot of things like data collection and analytics, for sure. Right? So you can, because now you can look at the data in a different way. Um, a lot of the data that was sitting in the on sensors and machines are very proprietary uh, protocols and communication. You need engineers like to, to, to access the data. Um, probably most of you have heard about the PC way and how much OPC way tried to solve some of the big old languages that the machines talk, right? So we never we never got to a point where I, at least in my opinion that that became a very new form protocol to communicate. OPC way had some success, but not a lot to make it to a new form access to the data. So the reality is that data was still sitting in silos and mostly being controlled, mostly being used to control, not for anything else. Uh, well now those factory four groups they have IT coming in and saying, give it a day, I need it. Mm. Oh, you're not going to control the machines? No, but I still need the data, I want it. Right? And it's creating a huge fight, right? So I saw some sites you to show about bridge, OD with IT, right? So how to connect the operational technology team to the information technology team. Completely two different paradigms of thinking, and I'm mostly from the IT side, so my, my history is coming from information technology. Uh, it's the way I define is like it's a virtual world versus a physical world. Right? So the IT is very used to deal with virtual problems. Like it's very typical in a life cycle building application in IT. Oh, build it, test it, it's not working, fix it, run it again. Still not working, fix it, run it again. Yeah, that's all right. <laughs> Software eventually works. Right? Hardware eventually breaks, software eventually works. <laughs> and well, you cannot do this on a factory floor, right? With a multi million dollar machine. Like, those people are like, well, well, wait. Like, and, 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 and they know each other very well, right? So, like, you know, they know each other already to the point where, like, no, no, you think they're in your board, I think they're mine, okay? You live your life only in mine. Well, those two worlds are clashing. So, they're like, and they're trying to impose some of their paradigms over to each other. There are some, some uh, schools of thinking that think IT will take over. I don't think so. Um, I think, it, like, put everything under the CIO up there. Right? So I think it's still going to be quite separated because they're so so different. Until something from the technology point of view solves those two parts, make them more like each other, I think it's going to take a while. And edge computing is part of that later. Okay? But there are a bunch of other reasons, right? So we have a lot of questions about, hey, I'm trying to build my own OEA. What does that mean? Like, why, why just don't buy a package? Well, uh, small and medium manufacturing companies, they don't have money to buy those expensive packages that do OEA. And it's not also customizable to their operation. And a lot of times, they have cells, like manufacturing cells, that have one machine controlled by PLC, and a bunch of other things that are not even digital. <laughs> So like, how, so wait a minute, so we are involved in projects which require sensorization. You have to add sensors. You have, so the whole big question, integration, right? You need, it needs integration. So if you want to build something that gives you some information where you can start to evaluate efficiency on a cell or on, the, on your whole plant, um, more likely than not, it's a customized project. Edge computing is coming as a layer that will help you to have solutions that doesn't require customization in that extent. Right. One of the one of the benefits of edge computing, right? It's being used for automation control to we have to solve one of the projects that I'll talk about here in a minute. It's really about uh, this huge company in the US uh, that uh, they are they were using um, Excel spreadsheets to reprogram their PLCs, <laughs> their PLCs. So it's a it's a assembly line, it's not transformation line, it's an assembly line. And if they have to re, re, re uh, um, structure the assembly line, pull out the Excel spreadsheet, copy and paste the code, and update the PLCs with the new code. Um, sounds scary, but it's been, it's been done like 10 years at least. 
very inefficient, right? or it's like it takes a long time to re restructure the, the plant, while they're using edge computing to just push its permission down through the production line and share the coding. The code is still done manually, but they don't have to put the spreadsheet anymore, so they can actually just share the code using edge computing as a layer to share this change down the production line. So that's one of the examples, okay? Bridge code to NIT, we already talked about that. Uh, improved time to record, that's a lot of uh, predictive maintenance and predictive analytics, uh, trying to understand, hey, this is the long break or something like that. That information usually requires uh, a lot of historical data, right? So um, I was just I was just talking to another person here to show about the depth of the historians. <laughs> the historian database. How many of you use a historian database? Okay. Historian? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's it's usually like what I what I learned uh, looking to how historian database fit into automation. Usually it's like we're forced to use them. I, I, they don't. They, they deliver to some extent what they're supposed to do, but it's very focused on, well, let's get the data somehow here, but they have limited the capacity to acquire the data, and usually uh, expensive, which is part of the problem. Edge computing is an extra layer that, in my opinion, will replace historians quite a bit, with way more flexibility, so. But, uh, time to recover is part of that, right? And then, of course, AI and machine learning, now, huh? huge, but huge, and it's, it, by huge, I mean really, Massive things beyond the beyond the the cliche of like oh artificial intelligence here yeah <laughs> like I was joking about the AR like yeah I'm, uh, I'm into reality here and now last year was I'm into reality two years ago was I'm into reality now it's AI 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 right? I do think AI is way more important than augmented reality was trying to be at some point I think AI is its solution for us well a little bit of information from my like, research is talking about right so. Quickly become the decentralized components to a larger centralized implementation, which is the cloud. And I think that's a major pushback from, from the from how the cloud failed to deliver the big prominence. It's like I send everything to the cloud, yeah, send everything to the cloud and pay the price for that. And then you're not gonna have the efficiency of like how of performance that you're gonna need. Um, the data is far away. It's a very IT, send everything to the cloud is a very IT thing to say. Like it's going back to the virtual versus the physical, in my opinion. That's exactly how IT thinks about, yeah, put it over there. You have infinite storage with infinite bandwidth and infinite CPU capacity. <laughs> well, yeah, okay, uh, yeah. Uh, if you have infinite money, that's fine, right? But um, I don't think anyone here has it, right? So, uh, and should be so many pricing protection issues, uh, like sovereignty and acceptable latency. Latency is a big problem for sure. Um, latency and um, the, the interruption in connectivity, like connectivity being interrupted all the time. So one of the projects we're going to talk about in the minutes here is really send everything to the back office, but even the, the cloud, the back office kind of a private cloud, and what happens if you, the data is not there when you need it? Who lost it? <laughs> like, did you send it? Did you not send it? And I, what happened, right? So, and connectivity because of physical, like, all the interference that happens in the factory floor, um, there's lots of Wi-Fi being used, but Wi-Fi is like, not very trustable. There's some 5G implementation going on there. Also, various uh, subject to interference. So, connectivity is uh, is part of the reason why edge computing is being used as a, as a way to stage data close to the machines. Some numbers. Uh, these are predictions, right? Gardner, Gardner likes to do cryptology here. I think they're probably right. I kind of, I feel the same. Sorry. But we're talking like large enterprise. We're talking as a strategy for edge computing. Right now, last year, 10 percent, they're predicting 70 percent of those large enterprise uh, places will have some kind of edge computing strategy. Um, and how many of them are planning to deploy some kind of machine learning solution, right? So half of the companies, that's very aggressive, but I think it's realistic. Right? I mean, it's not too too far from too far fetched. I've seen some problems with entrepreneurs where they thought about this really cool. <laughs> and the implementation I had was really, really cool. I saw like, wow, I want to be part of this. <laughs> it's really, really very interesting. So, so let's talk a little bit about the case, right? So, um, case number one here is like, finally to provide an out of the box uh, predictive maintenance for certain purposes. Okay. So, machines. This is a machine, uh, the manufacturing machines. The machines are already coming with some kind of intelligence and some kind of ability to share data, right? But they want to expand it. 
You want to explain it in a way where the data is actually more available for other applications and also more enriched. So the amount of data you're sharing today is limited to some extent. Because it's mainly designed like what they provide today was designed mainly to control the, the, the press, um, they want to do the next step, right? So you can see when you look into the stack, how far down the stack is for people who start to think about, well, I need to get this data forward. Like this is a this is a company manufacturing presses, and they are already trying to bypass all the cycles. No, 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 you get the data from me directly. So we're trying to build a way on a layer on the machine that automatically already sends the data to a different uh, to a different level of information, right? So the complexity of the data, right? They're completely trying to reshape their mind in terms of like the data here right now in the past was a bunch of tabs on the PLC because people were gonna write some code here and gonna control the press. That's not what I'm talking about here. No. They're talking about, I want to get all my data, whatever it is, and I want to make it available for people to start to analyze my press in a smarter way. And it's interesting because when you talk to them, you can see all those questions going through, like what does that mean? Like what kind of applications they're trying to target? They don't even know. <laughs> like who's building the applications? Who's developing that? You know, it's gonna be the cloud. There are some standards. Market, the market is selling on some standards very fast, by the way, like MQTT is one of them. Uh, how, many, how many of you have heard about MQTT? Yeah, see, more people than using stores. <laughs> yeah, MQTT is, is becoming the fact the standard to get things connected on the factory floor. Funny enough, not this not this sort of design for that, but I mean designing QST for it's still actually, but not exactly for, for what it's being used today. But it became a fast way to get data out of things and share with other things, like share with applications, share with the cloud, share like you can use MQTT today to push data to SAP. Like so how, how sophisticated is that to remember SAP? which I mean, they're just saying it's the most proprietary software company in the world, right? So they have their offer, but they have everything. Like, no, buy from me, buy from me. Well, yeah, they use super input the you can understand it inside SAP using MQTT. So to that point where it became a de facto uh, standard to the market. It does happen. They were considering, they're considering using it for sure. They can just keep it the way to go. Um, but you can see some of the things, and it's, it's interesting because they sell this in two different ways. Like, there, there's the press, and they sell also the gateway. As a separate thing, so you can buy a gateway, you can plug into the press. Um, they want to do both products uh, uh, available for like pushing this data out. So they're bringing the edge closer to the machine, essentially. That's what it is. If you want to keep the gateway, I'm fine. The gateway, the gateway is like, sorry, I'm using kind of the legal here, but I'm confused. But a gateway is a, it's a computer running close to the machines. Or it could be anything. Okay, it could be like an IPC, it could be a single body computer, it's like kind of all kinds of well, uh, computers being produced out there that can operate as a gate, right? Even the big ones like Dell is trying to get into the market, pushing high end servers for, for, for edge computing, but I think it's going to sell on a smaller environment. That's why ARM has become as big as they are, right? But, uh, so they, with their approach, it's interesting because they're trying to fuse edge computing closer to the machine and give them an option here. There are some other companies experimenting with that, like Siemens, for example. They have already PLCs where the PLC is a virtual machine, and IPC is a not a virtual machine, inside a single piece of hardware. Right? So two virtual machines running with the PLC being a virtual machine, which is quite interesting, and an IPC gear on the side. So the IPC actually operates as a gateway, a local gateway to control the PLC. Right? I have no idea if this is going to succeed for which I know they're pushing hard on that approach. It can have some, some uh, yeah. extent, but... So in this case here, we're helping them to build a solution using um, taking all this data from machines in a more, in an easier way. Because remember, they're not software developers, right? So they, they manufacture a machine. So they're trying to find a solution. That's why out of the box is important here. How can we build something flexible enough that we can adapt for different kinds of machines, different types of presses, you know, also has to be affordable. And at the same time, we're giving this to people that are going to try to use the data, so it has to be some kind of standard. Uh, and we're not talking about control center, we're talking about, in this case, it's mostly MQTT. Right? And MQTT, for those that are not familiar, it's a JSON-based protocol, so it turns everything into JSON. All the messages are JSON-based, fairly simple to use, like the web application, whatever you want, right? So, um, very, very easy to like, 
So I'll just the next one here, things evolved in unified data models. So if you want to buy a beautifully unified data model, James is the mission goal. So that's case number one. Okay. This is the one I said, that's really cool. This is the one I, we're um, super happy with the the project here. Uh, this is a huge multinational company. One of the leaders in one of the car parts. I cannot say the car part because you're going to find out who they, who they are. <laughs> but they have like 90 plants worldwide. And all they want to do is to take all the raw data from the machines in all their 90 plants, send it over to AI based on machine learning. It's a company, it's a German company that says, send me all your raw data, I'll sell you back information. <laughs> Which is, why am I going to build this support? I don't want to say creepy because I don't think it's creepy, I think it's cool. <laughs> but it's, it's, it's massive, right? Imagine, imagine we are at the point in technology where you can approach, you, there are some numbers here, it's huge, right? So they have 100 automation software plant. Each one, they, the problem they're facing, they, they put together like a, a mini prototype with basic tools they had, and they were able to get one data point per second. And then they tried to scale up, and they couldn't. Yeah, there is a, there is a bunch of tools out there that give you some level of, get some of the data, sometimes even from the, from the manufacturers, like in this case, they were using some of the manufacturers that are like, oh yeah, we have some software, just use ours, it's free, it comes with, it comes with the machine, it's free, but it doesn't do what it needs to do, like what they need to do, which is really scale up to a level where they can do this all, in you know, all 90 plants around the world. Um, so the challenge they are having here is, I think it's maybe true, number one is uh, the flexibility of the data, because you can imagine, like, some of their plants are in Asia, you know, some of their plants are in the US, lots of plants in Latin America, um, Gathering all this data, walking into one of the plants and saying, hey, install this, and now I can get whatever data you have, and I'm gonna send this to a website in Germany. <laughs> how, how do you build this without having to write a bunch of code? Right? And, and what so the, their approach is let's add an edge computing layer in front of every plant, where the first thing we do is take all the data out of the machines and put it over to this. And now, you leave production in peace, they don't have to mess with that anymore, right? So it's a very decoupling approach where like, don't just touch it to take it out, but that's it. Now store it here, because there's a lot of data. You cannot just say, oh yeah, let's keep saying this in streaming or that. No, it's not gonna work, <laughs> right? You can't just assume everything's gonna be online all the time. You're gonna lose data. So they have to stage it locally on the edge. They're building a staging locally on the edge, worldwide. And then the next step is, okay, now let's push this data over to the service provider that's going to sell us information back based on whatever they learn. The goal here is to try to identify improvements um, uh, in like um, pattern lines, like assembly lines and all that, try, hey, switch this and that, change this process, for example. Hey, it's hard to tell that AI is going to come back. <laughs> it's a very interesting project because like, what is AI going to be able to include uh, out of the raw data is just by moving into all day. Yeah. Are they finding that the data is going too, too much to store at the local fine? No, not at all. They're actually storing all of them on the edge. The, the, the project is exactly that. Like how to define the edge layer to be able to store all the data locally until it's pushed forward. So there is a, there is a cycle here, right? So they don't keep the data on the edge forever. <laughs> this is very important. The, this data this data ages very fast, right? So it says, like, I was joking about sensors off, sensors off, so it's like, oh, yeah, you want it, yeah, you want it, you don't want it forever. <laughs> like, you don't want to say, oh, yeah, it wasn't off 25 years ago. Uh, yeah, right, so we don't care that much. So there is a, there is a role in here on the data that has to happen, uh, but the edge layers are adding this capacity, you know, like, can you do, again, without, the goal here is really to make it in a way that you don't have to involve a lot of programming, a lot of coding. Uh, like a lot of these projects, they, there are system integrators that companies hire them to build something for them. It gets to this point here, and then it gets so, so complex that it can't can keep going, right? So, what edge computing is doing is getting the next step. Oh, no, wait a minute. Now you have tools that you can build more complex solutions. And you can do this in a way where it's just parts and pieces you put together, and things start to flow. Data start to flow. Ultimately, edge computing is really a way to flow the data. Get the data first, safe, once it's produced, and now do whatever you want with the data. Send it forward, send it horizontally, 
Bradbury calls this north, south, east, west. So if you want to send north, south, like, oh, I want to send this data to the cloud, that's north, south, right? Kind of makes sense, I guess. Or if you want to send it from this gateway to this gateway, you can, right? So it's almost machine to machine talking or sales talk to other sales. Does that make sense? Yeah. Look at that. You know, I'm curious as to why they said that the cloud company keep their intellectual insight and properties uh, when they provide the data to the cloud company. Well, they're not they're like they're just feeding a neural network with this raw data, with all the tags, sensors, blah 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 from the machines. That's what it is. So, but it's they're feeding this with some modeling coming from the this this is the expertise from this AI company, right? So they have industrial models, they're building industrial neural networks that can take this raw data from machines and process that and come back with facts. So the data is being kept on the edge and then sent forward huh, to feed it out. No, you can talk more about that to people. Yes, yes, yes. Nice. So here's another example. Uh, this is the one I was talking a bit about, uh, before about using Excel spreadsheets to reprogram machines in PLCs, right? So this, they have multiple roles, but like they, they started with this, with this problem, like, hey, can I reprogram machines in a more efficient way? Can I do an easier way right now would be, let's get rid of manual Excel spreadsheets and maybe just set it down to the, the pipe and say, hey, reprogram your machine here, the operator, reprogram your machine using this, they call it recipes, Use this recipe here to reprogram your machine because we're gonna change the line up here. So that's, that was step number one. But they quickly realized that there's way more they can do here. One of them was to build a unified data model, UDM. So we, because there's so much data gain and this is also a large company, they were like, well, I think we better build some kind of unified data model where people can come in and grab the data whatever they want. So this was a major fight between IT and OT. Huge IT department fighting for decades saying, all this data belongs to me, I don't know why you're boarding it. <laughs> and they were like, no, this data doesn't belong to you, I use this data to control my machines. You have nothing to do with this data. Uh, edge computing is changing that, right? So the RB forces said, no, no, we cannot just import this data. Uh, you have to share it. Okay, I'm not sure. And I was, I was in one of the meetings, it was very really funny, because the IT guy comes in and comes way really stressed out, just like, you don't, you're not sending me a data, you're not sending me a data. Like, oh, you have to tell me which data you want. <laughs> and then the IT was like, I don't think you have a saw machine in your life. Like, he doesn't even know what to ask. <laughs> Like, when, when exactly he was going to ask this? Like, yeah, well, no, just send me everything. He's like, yeah, you don't want everything. Like, no, no, I want everything. So, yeah, so it was an interesting arm fight between those two groups. Like, very, very interesting to see, like, two different products. They got from IT just stomped out and they don't really jump into the lab. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> sure. <laughs> You're going to get all the data from here, right? But it also created some, some department division, right? So, what OT ended up doing here, part of this project, is really to create a layer for whoever wants to come over, grab the data that you want, come over here, it's here. It's not here, it's here. Which is edge computing, right? So edge computing is again, a coupling layer where you can come over here and pick up the data that you want, but it has to be in a form of that actually a little bit better. This is like, has to be generic enough. That's where the unified data model comes in. ID, on the other hand, was interesting because ID tried to take over this project and say, well, I'm not going to make my own solution here. So they chose the MQTT, I think it's the right decision, and they said, we're just going to buy a broker, put it over here in the data center, send it all over to me over here. Uh, I guess. Yeah, so, so I saw the project, I saw the project taking off and crashing, because what crashed in this project was that when they bought this MQTT broker to put it in IT department, the data center, uh, the broker was not designed for the volume of data that start to push over there, so they start to lose data. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, like, you're not sending out the data. No, I am. No, you're not. No, I did. No, you didn't. Where is it? It's not here. It's not where. It's no, it's nowhere. <laughs> then all of a sudden, like, well, we can be. Like, we, in long story short, my, my, my understanding of the problem there was that they didn't consider to buy a robust enough entity broker for the data center. IT made a choice using IT rules with the virtual mindset that I was talking before, and they chose a platform that is not robust enough to handle all the bottom of data that was coming over here. 
Because this is part of the new fight between those two groups, I will keep the side, you know what? I'm gonna store everything on the edge, and if you come back later and say, you never sent it to me, I can go back and say, no, I did, it's right here. <laughs> so it's an historical, like, almost like an auditing of data, proof of point showing that we did send it to you, <laughs> you lost it, your problem. Right? So that's part of the project right now. But you can see like how many different layers of complexity those edge computing projects are achieving at this point, right? So this is really, it's here to stay, it's gonna evolve, it's gonna get more and more complex. I think it's, I think it's fascinating, I like it. <laughs> oh, sorry, I didn't mention that. So bringing its own persistent data layer, right, to all that, that's, that's essentially the last bullet there. Like, they wanna make sure, hey, it's right here, it's persistent, I can go back, I can audit whatever you need, but it's my data, ultimately, and I'm feeding you with that data. So if you wanna come over here and grab it, but if you're gonna complain about something, I have my own track records here of what has been produced in terms of data. It's a major shift of mentality for the OT team because they were used to see all the data just flowing to control machines. Now they have to actually store the data yeah, and deal with it. Let's check on. Well, it out later. <laughs> this is a lot of interesting group project like data collection and analytics. Um, this is a compressor manufacturer, again, a machine company. They build machines, they're trying to, they're trying to get into the service business. Uh, selling real-time analysis of the productivity of those machines. Uh, it's very ambitious projects, in my opinion. Uh, and they also they also want to be able to get those machines connected to the ERP automatically. So feeding the ERP automatically. Uh, that part I don't think is so ambitious. I think it's very simple to implement. But uh, adding adding generic analytics on top of machines, I think it's a little bit of a big step here um, because it's hard to model. I don't know, what does it mean? Like, like what you exactly you want to try to extract from those uh, compressors that you're selling. The manufacturer compressors, they want to sell those compressors in a way that their customers can automatically get some intelligence out of the machines. Uh, I think they're going to have to take a little bit of a step back. But at the same time, also, they're also building them with, uh, with uh, integration to the ERP. Integration to the ERP is a huge attribute project, really. Like, just add an extra layer here, collect data from your compressors. Push it over to the ERP. Uh, these projects are very interesting. They're all over the place. People are doing all the doubt from the well, high end companies all the way to the small ones. Um, pretty much everybody has an ERP, right? Even the small manufacturers have an ERP. Sometimes some local vendor, but they do have an ERP. And this is, I think it's massive too. It's a major transformation for manufacturing because right now most of those most of the information are disconnected. Right? So like we, we joke about the, the manager sitting up there in the wiring, right? And, and the guys up here in the floor operating the machines. How those two worlds talk to each other is very, very manual right now. And this is trying to solve part of that. Like, for example, can I do a uh, capacity plan? You know, can I order, uh, don't run out some of, uh, some of my suppliers, I need to buy something more because I can see that the production line sales is coming. And that way, runs also true, right? So sales is pushing. Selling a lot, well, I better buy more because I'm going to be able to build more. Where is the information of if they're selling too much coming from? From their ERP, right? So, like, is the ERP capable to feed it back and restructure your assembly line because you're selling a lot or less than you were planning before? So, can that information start to be automatically flowing and controlling things in a better, efficient, more efficient way? Yes, I think you can. It's not a difficult to you know? It's edge computing mostly. Because you're gonna have to get all the data out of the machines. They're struggling a little bit with the part of uh, which data we want, like especially because, like I mentioned before, some cells, the machines control what you'll see easy enough, but there's a bunch of things that are very digital there, and they're important if you want to do some planning. So you have to add some sensorization to that. That's kind of where they're, they're struggling you now. But again, it's like a very good example of of edge uh, computing. And I think this is the last one. This is a, this is a little bit different than the other ones. This is a smart city project. So um, it's a company monitoring gas distribution, like natural gas or um, commercial, also like residential. They already have some sensors spread across the city. They're trying to get this in Latin America. They're trying to uh, reduce, like those sensors are powered by solar power. They're trying to consume solar energy because the sensors are not out battery, right? So the reason why they run off battery is because they're processing everything locally on the, on the sensor. Uh, and they're trying to say, hey, can I add 
uh, uh, Nash and Mike's here that collapsed the data immediately at that business center along with the massive weather cut. Uh, so you can pull yourself like really adding a match layer here to what what's well, this is a very common trend in the industry, right? So she got for her smart sensor, smart sensors, right? So yeah, they're getting more and more fat on the sensors, trying to get the sensors bigger. <laughs> <laughs> Adding them just to the sensor. Well, well this edge computer is going, no, 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 let's separate them, okay? Keep the sensor doing whatever it's supposed to do, but let's add a layer of edge computer to separate, which is, I think, it's the right thing to do because it's processing, right? So data processing. So you have crypto things separate. And this guy from Melbourne is right now, it's an MVP mode right now, so there's like a basic prototype out there. I'm trying to see if adding a gateway to those, uh, to those sensors will help keep the sensors. Uh, uh, longer, uh, running longer with less energy. Uh, very interesting project, but I thought it was interesting to share with you because just to give you a little bit of a different flavor than getting out of manufacturing. Because smart cities, there's a lot going on in smart cities, that's true. Right? So several, several projects going on in smart cities. They take a little bit of a different approach. There's a lot of mobility involved, like 5G and all that, because especially with transport, right? Some of the kind of things, but, uh, but still, it's a beauty. It's a new layer of data processing that's being added. All right, so just to wrap it up a little bit here, so like I mentioned in the beginning, like we're with Faircom, Faircom, we're a data based company. Um, Faircom was founded in 1979, an American company. We have two offices in the US, one in Europe, one in, in North America, in Brazil. And we build a database which is today called as NoSQL database. Before NoSQL was a thing, and we have hundreds of thousands of customers all around the world, and we are essentially a transactional database that gives you high-speed access to the data in a safe, mission-critical way. So we have customers like credit card processing companies, payment systems, the 401k here in America, and 90% of the 401k in America here is our database running behind the scenes. We have several high-end applications running with our technology, but we also have a lot of embedded systems. So, Robots, you know, our database is very fast in a small uh, embedded device like QSS, you know, like Japan is a big uh, market process store, they have a lot of uh, technology. So we decided on the computer, like, well, what I have is inside of all edge computing that I think we could build an edge computing solution uh, based on our database, but for mission critical applications. So if you're concerned about can I collect the data, store it, and then do transformations with the data without, without having to write any code. Our solution called Perform Edge does exactly that. It's designed to be out of the box in a way where you can install it, deploy it, configure it. We start to buy the data and store it on the edge. We have all the controls and mechanisms to make sure you don't run out of space and all this. And we give you the configuration tools to transform this automatically to a package team or other ships. It has a full API, so if you want to build an application that assumes the data directly from there, you can. But if you don't want to write any code, you can. And we support right now PC Wave, we support C7, we support all gravity, we have one bus connectors, and we're expanding every time we're expanding additional protocols to support more and more input data. So we call it a hub, this is an actual beauty hub, because you can connect any devices and sensors you want to have over here, you store it locally, and then through our interface you can say, oh, take all this data, put it all together in a JSON message and push it forward. Mm -hmm. We'll do that for you. So there is an entity broker embedded here as well. It's a mission critical entity broker because it sits on top of a transactional database. So everything that flows in, we store with transaction control, and now from here we push it up, push it forward. So if you, there, there are some open source alternatives out there, they're free, but if you cannot lose your data, or if you want, if you need uh, scalability, this solution addresses all those problems. And we we have a booth here, I showed about that, so if you guys have time, just stop the bar and say hi over there, okay? And that's it. Thank you.